Here's how the mini messages are going to go, and then we'll really get into it, okay? We have a topic for the day. We'll pop it up here. It says, I got stronger when I let go of blank. So each speaker is going to follow this format, um, and I'm going to go ahead and kick it off with mine. So I got stronger when I let go of comfort. When I let go of comfort. How many of us love our comfort? We love things that are easy, things that are convenient. We love the drive through at McDonald's. Like, we love when things are easy and right there in front of us. We love to be comfortable. But can I tell you, Jesus says something in the scriptures that actually calls us out of comfort. And I think in order for many of us to get stronger, we got to lean into these words. He says this in Mark chapter 8. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, if anyone wishes to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Jesus comes straight at us. He says, deny yourself. Deny your natural tendency to lean in to the comfortable things of life. Because if it was up to us, we would all do the easy thing. We would all take the path of least resistance, right? But Jesus says, if you want to follow me, it's not going to be all rainbows and butterflies. You must deny yourself. And then he says, take up your cross. And can I tell you, the cross was not a symbol of hope. The cross was not something that was great. You know, we wear it around our, 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 our necks on a necklace. We put it all over the walls in our churches. But the cross was not a symbol of hope back then. The cross was a symbol of death. It was a, it was a symbol of a fate that was already determined. It was, it was the opposite of hope. It was uncomfortable. And Jesus said, if you want to follow me, deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. That's what he says. Um, a few years ago, I've shared this story a few times, but um, I found it fitting for today. I was working at Domino's, and I had a friend who I grew up with um, ever since I was in elementary school. And one day when I was on the shift at, at Domino's, I was delivery driver. I came in from the road. I had just delivered some pizza to someone, and I came back in, and this particular friend was in the store. And I wanted to say, I was like, hey, what's going on, man? Like, great to see you. And as I passed him, I felt this urging to stop and to say, like, to say more than hi. Like, I felt like God was telling me I needed to, like, you know, maybe share the gospel with him or, or pray with him or something more than just a simple interaction of, hey, how's it going? And I didn't. And let me tell you why. Because I was chained to my comfort. If I would have stopped, I would have had to answer to my boss. I would have had to say, you know what, sorry, I, I had to talk to this guy. I would have went into my break time potentially. I would have had to stay later to clean up everything that night because I would have stopped and talked to this person. There would have been a delivery that I would have missed out on and I wouldn't have made as much money. Like, it was easier for me to avoid the conversation, to avoid the prompting that God had given me. I took the comfortable road. And can I tell you, a few days later, I woke up to a phone call saying my friend had committed suicide. And all I could think about was that interaction that I had a few days prior. And I thought, Austin, what if you would have chosen to get uncomfortable? What if you would have chosen, instead of remaining inside this box that you were so happy in, where would your friend be? I don't know where he's, I don't know if he's in heaven or if he's in, but like, I could have said something. I could have, I could have done something, but I was so tied to comfort that I missed out on the purpose that God had for me. And I want you to remember this today, that comfort distracts you from purpose. Comfort is one of Satan's greatest deceptions because it makes us feel like we have it all figured out. It makes us feel like we have it all together. It is a great illusion to be comfortable. It's the American dream, right? We want to be comfortable. It's like we work hard so that way we can have enough money, we can have enough food, we can have nice houses. The dream is comfort. But can I tell you, church, that a life following Jesus is one where you deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. That's what it's about. And can I tell you, after that moment where my friend had, had died tragically, I vowed to myself I, I, I would start stepping out. I would get a little bit more uncomfortable. I would begin to lean into these situations when God would prompt my heart. And can I tell you, it's not just about like um, where I'm evangelizing to somebody, but, but in our daily life, let me tell you this. Imagine what could happen if, if instead of choosing comfort, you chose discomfort. Imagine what would happen if you decided to prep meals for your week instead of go to McDonald's every day in the drive-thru. Imagine what would happen if, if instead of spending three hours binging Netflix, you decided to spend some time with God. Imagine what would happen if instead of um, sleeping, you decided to, to read your Bible. Like imagine what would happen in your life if you decided to take the uncomfortable route. What would your life look like? Would you grow? Would you learn something new? Would you be closer to God? Can I tell you that anything meaningful and worth doing in life, there will be opposition. Nobody has ever done anything great without it. 
Nobody has ever had a great dream and a great big thing that they've done and did not face opposition. It has always been hard because Jesus said it. We are to deny ourselves and pick up our cross. Other places in the Bible say, don't be surprised when you experience the fiery ordeal. Do not be surprised when you experience these tough things in life. You will have to endure. That's what the Bible promises. But can I tell you that you will get stronger when you let go of comfort. And that's my mini message for the day. So uh, that's a tough transition, I guess. Um, and we're just getting started. Can I tell you, we have four amazing preachers coming up next. So we're going to go ahead and introduce the next one. My name's Lynette. As Austin said, I'm super excited to talk about this. Um, okay, my papers are in the wrong order. Bear with me. I would have to start from the back. I got stronger when I let go of control. Ephesians 3.20 tells us, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than I could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within me. Exceedingly and abundantly. Some other versions say it infinitely more. Another one says super abundantly more. And then another one says immeasurably more. We are unable to measure what God can do for us. The scripture has many um, I've, areas of my life that the scripture affects, but um, because I've tried to control my own life. I'm going to tell you a little story. It's happened over about the past 10 years. Some of you know. My son was a drug addict. He was addicted to drugs. I say was because he is not anymore. He, amen. He is free and God has redeemed what was lost and that includes his identity. It's not who he is anymore. But it was a long 10 years, give or take. It's really hard to be in control when you feel helpless and you have no control. I was really struggling. I've struggled. I asked God for help. I knew that God would help me. Lord, please, I would beg and plead. And then I would get up and I would do it my way every time. When someone that you love, thank you. When someone that you love is addicted or living in addiction or stuck in addiction, it's one of the most helpless feelings you can ever have. There's constant worry. Where are they? Are they okay? What did they eat? Have they eaten? Have they been arrested? Sometimes my phone would ring and my stomach would just drop. It would be instant heartache. But I was finally able to be strong enough to give God control and say, I love you, son but I'm not going to help kill you. I'm not going to enable you to keep going. So I had to turn my back. And for those of you that know me, that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done as well. That goes against everything that I am in general. Whoops, it could have been tragic. <laughs> So I really began to seek after God. I was asking God, what do you say about me? I was reading the word. What do you say about my son? Who are we in God? And I found trust. Not trust in God because he already has all my trust. I found trust in myself that I was strong enough to give God the control. He gave me such a peace that no matter what outcome would come out of my son's life, no matter where he ended up, no matter where, whatever that looked like, and that's a hard place, I knew that God would use it for his good because that's what he promises to do. Romans 8, 28. I can't remember exactly when it happened, but I remember thinking one day when something had happened, okay, God, here you go. You're up. I trust you. And I felt instant peace. And I don't remember carrying any struggles or trying to do it myself anymore after that. 
It was a long road. I've been growing along the way. I have my son back. He's stronger than ever in his life and in his relationship with God. Because God can do exceedingly abundantly more than I can think, ask, or imagine. Why would I, why would I do it myself when I know the creator of the world can do more than I can even do? He lives in you. He lives in me. According to his power, that is at work within me, within you. He wants to be a team. You just have to pick what side you're on. If you're not on his side, there's only one other side. You need to decide. You can't be on the fence. What do you need to release control over your life? That's my question I'm going to leave you with today. What have you been carrying that God wants to take care of for you? He wants to wow you just like he did me. And that's how I became stronger when I gave up control. So good, so good. Lynette, you killed it. Man, we have the best preachers here at Zeal Church. Come on, this is incredible. How many of you guys have some control you need to let go of? Uh, I do, I do. I'm one of those guys, control freak. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention this earlier. We, every speaker today has their own walk-up song, okay? Like, these are songs that they selected. I selected my song. Lynette selected hers. And I think you guys are really going to love this next speaker we have and the next song that's coming up. So would you guys get ready and lean in for our next speaker? Thank you. I bet you didn't think that I liked Skillet, did you? <laughs> Anyways, hi, I'm Michael Peterson. Um, I got stronger when I let go of myself. <laughs> Proverbs 18.1 says that whoever isolates himself seeks his own desires. He breaks out against all wisdom, meaning he doesn't want to listen to any wisdom. I accepted Jesus into my heart when I was seven or eight. I have always felt like I was good with God. I believed in him. I went to church enough. I would pray and I knew enough of the Bible that I could somewhat play the part. But I didn't have a true relationship with Jesus. I, was, I always wanted to do church and God my way. When we started coming to Zeal, I was the guy who would show up, sit in the third row from the back, right next to Bud. <laughs> and when church was over, Boom, I was out. I didn't feel like I had anything in common with the guys at church, so I just stuck to myself. There were times when I would convince myself that I wanted to go to another church because they had that amazing feel or hype. Sometimes I would come up with excuses of why not to go to church. I would hear of an online speaker and so I just sit on my couch, listen to the speaker, while my family came to zeal. And then there was the fact that none of this was my first priority. The mountains and hunting were my number one. <laughs> if I had the opportunity to go hunting or go to the mountains, I was going. And my wife Amber would ask me, babe, are you coming to church this weekend? And I'd be like, nope, I'm going to the mountains. <sighs> She'd say, but you haven't been to church for a while. I'd come up back with something like, I'm closer to God when I'm up there. <laughs> Higher elevation, you know. <laughs> of course, this would make her a little bit mad. And that would give me the opportunity to use my um, own twist on Proverbs 21:19, Babe. It says in the Bible that it is better to live in the wilderness <laughs> than at home with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. <laughs> totally not the way that verse was intended, and it definitely didn't make things any better. <laughs> All of this time, I would have my wife and family trying to speak life to me. I see my uh, in-laws showed up today and they can vouch for that. I want to thank my mother-in-law for always trying to speak life into me. But because of past offenses, 
it would only build up anger. My mom used to dump water on me to get me to go to church. Sometimes it felt like five gallons like every Sunday, but I think it was probably only a half a cup like once. But anyways, I would listen to message after message about building a relationship with Jesus, but I didn't want to truly commit to that because I wanted to do my own thing. It seemed like a couple years ago this began to change. God really started softening my heart. I truly believe that this had to do with people praying for me. We were doing services downstairs and we were forced to be closer together. God started showing me in a different people in a different way. For some reason, I started allowing people's words to sink in. I felt like Every time Pastor Terry talked about building a relationship with Jesus, it was amplified. Privately, I made the decision to start seeking a stronger relationship with Jesus. Notice I said privately, I was still wanting to do it my way. I knew that I was growing closer to God, but I wasn't completely surrendering myself to him. I kept feeling like he was wanting me to give more. I continued to dig in and really started listening to his voice. He started telling me to make myself available and to be involved. He started speaking to me through other people's words and actions. At the annual church meeting this last year, they started talking a little bit about uh, zeal women or zeal girl. Afterwards, I asked my good buddy Chad, when are you guys going to start a zeal men? Chad replied, I don't know, Mike, when are you? (laughs) This hit home. The ladies started being very vocal about praying for strong men in the church, active men. Those prayers were answered, and this really hit home. Through Steve Rodarte, God started showing me a new meaning of friendship. He showed me that you don't necessarily have to have the exact same things in common to build, to create a special bond. Through Steve, and now all of the men and women at Zeal, I have been shown that no matter our differences or our backgrounds, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We are all family and we make up the body including me. No more sitting on the sidelines. I was going to use Luke 9, 23 and 24 as well, where it says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their own cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And so most importantly, he has shown me how much more fulfilling and rewarding life is when I seek after him, listen to his voice, and do things his way. This is how I got stronger when I let go of myself. So great. So awesome. So powerful. Thank you, Mike, for sharing that. That's something I think many of us desperately needed to hear. We just need to let go of ourself. So awesome. Hey, the party's not stopping just yet. We have another speaker coming right up here. So again, let's get excited and uh, let's welcome our next guest. Okay, I brought my bag here. Um, So when they were talking to me about, talking to you about what made me stronger, um, I thought, well, I put expectation on people. Okay, when I let go of that expectation, big burden came off. But I thought about the Apostle Paul, and you know how he had that thorn in his side. Um, Constant thorn. And it seems like putting expectation to people was always just a source of contention with me. You know, there's different levels, though. We can put our expectation into people um, in hospitality, like cashiers or whatnot, right? If that cashier's kind of grumpy with me today, I might leave offended or disgruntled or what have you. Those Taco Bell employees took a big hit last 
during COVID, right? Facebook was full of disgruntled people over Taco Bell. Those kids did a good job, though. Um, your coworkers? Anybody ever get like um, put your expectation in your coworkers? You expect them to be a certain way. You know, how many of you guys like things done a certain way, right? And then we go and ask somebody else to do it. Bad idea. Well, in my job, I, I deal more with parents, and so um, I expect kids to act a certain way, and if they don't, well, it must be their parenting. So I have, I have a couple of kids that, anyway, one, one young man in particular stands out to me, and he was struggling with some academic stuff and some other things as well, and I was really complaining one day. That light's really bright. Um, I was complaining. I just was complaining. And in the midst of my complaining, the Lord spoke to me. And he said this. In a quiet voice, he said, about this boy's mother, he said, she's doing the best she can. And I thought, huh. Okay, she's doing the best she can. Who am I to put my expectation on someone who's doing the best they can? Um, so I was able to let go of that. And... So cashiers, gas attendants, work partners, I think I was able to let go of those things. And I was doing, I'm doing pretty good. It's, it's daily, let me tell you, it's daily. Um, but how many of you put more expectation on the people that are closest to you? Your spouses and your kids, right? So what happens if your spouse comes home and you've had a hard day, you're, you really need to unwind, you've got to unload, and you, you know, Mike walks to the door, you know, he's, maybe he's had a bad day too. I expect him to listen to me or at least just be nice and, hey, honey, smile, um, but maybe he's had a rough day. But I've done put all of my expectation onto him. Now I'm hurt and I'm angry and I'm mad. Maybe I just walk away. Um, too many days of that, you guys, is really going to wreck your relationship. My expectation can't be on him. Where does it need to be? I don't, I can't, I don't want to be disappointed every day in how my husband reacts to me. Um, but I do it. So I say all that to say this, and this is the thing I thought about. It first came to my mind because, look, it, I dropped this for all of those other things, but I'm, you guys, I was still carrying this heavy, I put a lot of weight in this. I was really um, still carrying the heavy, heavy burden because I put my expectation on my children. My children were all raised in the church. They know the word of God. Um, my second daughter, this is gonna be a little rough. Um, she's 21. We expected her to fall in love with a man you know, marry a man and have a family, just like we all expect for our kids to do. And that didn't happen. In fact, she fell in love with a woman. <sighs> so in the eyes of the world, she's married to a woman. And this is a really touchy subject, I think, even in the church. But I know what the Word of God says, and so does she, and that's what makes it really hard. But putting my expectation in her decisions, and um, I was disappointed hopeless, angry, um, not knowing what to do, and I, could, I knew it was putting a wedge in our relationship um, that I didn't want there. And you know, it put a wedge in my relationship with the Lord too because there was this thing keeping me from Him. Um, and I carried it every day, every day. When I finally decided to partner with Him and let go of these things, um, and I realized that my ways are not His ways, his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Um, let me read to you real quick. Romans 5.5 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint. When I put my hope in him and not in the relationship that my daughter had with this woman, I was not disappointed. Um, because the love of God has been poured out in the hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I'm now free. You guys, I'm free to pour out the love to her, and Maria is, what I've learned, is the sweetest, um, loveliest person. Uh, how many of you have uh, adult kids that call you every single day? That's awesome. My daughter now, every day on the way home from work, she calls me. 
And you guys, it wasn't like that before. But when I let go of that expectation, now God can work now. And um, that's when I became stronger. I feel like now I'm able to love. I can love anybody. And I'm stronger because of that. So that's my... Man, today has been incredible so far, and, and really, I hope you're noticing, you know, there's kind of a theme, you know, in all of these messages today that um, we all have things that we need to let go of because it really points to who we trust. Do we trust in ourselves? Do we, do we, do we need to control things? Do we need to be comfortable? Do we, do we only trust ourselves? Like, are we expecting all these things from others and not from God? Like, who do we trust this morning? So really, we're answering that question. Where's our trust at? So um, this has been incredible so far. We got one more guest speaker for you. And let me tell you, you're going to love this next one. I I love this next one. And we're going to get excited right now. I need you guys to lean in because here comes our next guest speaker. You know, as we go into the message today for my portion, um, I'm reminded the Bible says in our weakness, he is made strong. When we talk about becoming strong, it's the strength of God in us. And so... I got stronger when I let go of my own understanding. In other words, the need to know everything. How many people need to know everything? Come on, let's be honest now. Sometimes we just want to, sometimes I think to myself, Lord, just come have a seat right here and just tell me exactly what's going to happen today. (laughs) What's going to happen in five years? What's 10 years look like? And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says it this way, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so I became stronger when I relinquished the need to know everything. I'm a very task goal-oriented person, if you can't tell by now. Um, My wife can tell you. (laughs) All the way back to when we first met, you know, just knowing where we're going, knowing what God's put on our heart for the future, and and wanting to work toward that future, whatever that future is, whatever God has put on your heart. Even maybe promises God's given you. You know, he gives you a promise, and you think, okay, Lord, when's this happening? Tomorrow, next month, next year, five years? When is this happening? And we see here, even in the book of John chapter 14, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he was telling them, I'm about to go away, but I will return. And of course, all they were thinking about is, when are you returning? How are you returning? How many days is it going to be? A month, a year, 10 years? Not knowing that that we, 2,000 years later, are still looking for his return, right? But at the time, they they became very anxious they, did, they were about to, they were, they were going to be in a place where they were not physically with Jesus, but Jesus was telling them, hey, I'm going to send someone just like me, and he is going to magnify me in your life, magnify Jesus and make himself famous. And so he said, and so he, he's telling the disciples these things, and so out of this, I want to draw a few things. Number one, and take this for yourself. When it comes to letting go of our own understanding, letting go of the need to know everything, because as you know by now, God works with us on a need-to-know basis. When we need to know it, he'll tell us, because what happens is if he tells us something prematurely, what do we try to do? We try to do it ourselves, but when God gives us a promise or gives us hope for the future, gives us a vision of a foreseen future, um, he's saying, listen... I didn't give it to you only for you to do it. I gave it to you to watch me do it in you. Amen? To watch me to, because I could tell you over the last 30 some years of marriage and ministry and life plus, um, that I could not have scripted this life as it has played out. Why? It was said earlier, God's ways are so much higher than our ways. His understanding is so much greater. And so number one, in Letting go of my own understanding, I had to say this. I don't have to understand God or his ways in order to trust him or obey him. 
I don't have to understand everything. Maybe you're here today and this is your first time and you don't know Jesus. And you're saying, you know what, you're going to have to give me a better case than this. There's a certain point where when you hear the good news that Jesus came and died and rose again and he gave his life for us, there's a certain point you have to trust it. You have to receive it. You're never going to totally understand it until you step into it. Amen? And so we have to trust God even when we don't understand. We have to obey, even obey God in his word and live out his word even when it doesn't make sense. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, one of my life verses, uh, verse 5 and 6, it says, trust in the Lord with some of your heart, all of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding or the need to know everything, but in all your ways, but in all your ways acknowledge him One of the NIV versions says this way, in all your ways, obey him. In other words, take him at his word, step out in faith, and he shall direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. And it will bring health, and I would say peace, it will bring health to your flesh and strength to your bones. In other words, the response to letting go is peace. The Bible says he'll give you a peace that surpasses all of your understanding. In order to have peace, you've got to let go. In order to have peace, you've got to say, God, I trust you. My second little point, I have to give up my need to know everything. And I've said this already, but to trust that I'm, that as, you know, I would always go around with this verse, uh, even early on in, in life, As a believer, I would always quote this verse out of Psalms 37, 23. The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Whenever I was in doubt, whenever I was not sure, whenever I was having trust issues and saying, God, I don't know if this is going to work out right or am I going the right way, there would be times I would just say to myself, but the steps of the righteous are ordered by God. The steps of the righteous are ordered by God. Even while I make my own plans, ultimately God is the one who establishes my footing. Amen? And then there is peace. Peace is the gift of God. Jesus told them before he was about to ascend to heaven, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace is a gift from God. Peace is not when everything is going right. Peace is when things are not going right and you still feel that calm in the storm. You still feel that assurance, that that strength of Christ. Peace is not, let me say it this way, peace is not just a feeling or a thing, but Jesus is peace. When you sense peace, it is Jesus He is the one who sticks closer than a brother. He's closer than our next breath. And so we're not just talking about a feeling. We're talking about the person. And then lastly, peace is God's supernatural affirmation. I said it once. We'll say it again. Verse Philippians 4, 7. The peace of God, which surpasses all of our understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I appreciate God's peace in this sense. Jesus says, I'm going to guard your heart. Your heart might feel broken right now, but I'm here to guard it. It might feel empty, might feel bruised, might feel it misunderstood, but if you will let go and let me have my way, I will guard it. And I will guard your mind as well, your heart and mind. How many of you, how many have, have been in a period of time when maybe you, you feel like your thoughts were just out of control? They just went everywhere. And you're just like, I can't do this. I can't go to sleep, and when I do get to sleep and I wake up, my mind starts racing again. God says here, let my peace guard your hearts and your minds. It's a gift from God. It's a gift that he's given us. And so as the musicians come forward this morning, and you've heard a lot said about letting go, letting go of comfort, letting go of control, letting go of myself, 
letting go of expectations of others, and now letting go of the need to know everything. I'm sure that, it, that one of these messages, if not all of them, have touched an aspect of every one of our hearts and lives today. And God wants to ask you, what will you let go today? Who did you identify? I'll admit, I was sitting over here while, the test, while they were preaching, and I'm just kind of bawling like a baby on some of them thinking, Lord, uh, I'm not sure if I can get to mine uh, because there's things to let go if we're going to have his peace, if we're going to have his joy, if we're going to have his comfort, and ultimately if we're going to have salvation. And so as you stand with me this morning, Maybe you're here today and you're saying, I'm going to ask the, well, I'll ask in a moment the prayer team to come after we pray this prayer. But some of you here this morning, you need to give up, you need to let go of your past. Past life, past sins, the things that bring shame, the things that bring condemnation, the things that bring fear, the things that bring emptiness uh, to your life. We know that without Christ, we can do nothing. The word tells us that he came, he died, he rose again. And he simply says this in Romans chapter 10. He says, if you would just believe me, believe in me, believe in what I have done for you. And if you'll confess it, saying, Lord, even though I don't understand everything, even though it doesn't all together make sense, can it be this easy? Yes, it can. It might not be easy leading up to, the, to that decision. Christ is the one who paid the price. All he asks is for us to accept it, to receive it. He says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, meaning that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate gift, the only one who can save us, Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says it this way. There is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. No other name. No other name. No other person. No other religion. There's no other name whereby we can be saved. He says if you, if you will accept this one called Jesus, you're going to be saved. You're going to be delivered. You're going to be set free. Amen. And if that's you here this morning... We're about to celebrate with you in just a moment. But if you're here this morning, you're saying, you know what? I need to let go of myself, my pride, my lack of understanding, and put my trust in Jesus today. And if that's you, would you show up, show up a big, bold hand this morning and say, yes, that's me. Yes, that's me. Yes, that's me. Praise God. Praise God. Let's give God praise here this morning. If you raise your hand saying, Pastor Terry, I want to accept Jesus in my heart today. If that was you, I want you to take one more step. We've been doing this the last several Sundays, and we get happy when we do this. It's so exciting. But if you're here this morning, you're saying, you know what? I want to accept Jesus in my heart this morning. Would you, with having raised your hand, would you say, I'm going to step out, and I want to come forward this morning, and I'm going to accept Jesus in my heart as Christ boldly gave his life Will you boldly receive him? Amen? Amen. And so as you step out right now, we're going to give the biggest shout of praise. But for those who raise their hand for salvation, come on down. Come meet me. Come meet me here at the front. Step out in the aisle. Yes. 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 Anyone else? Praise God. Praise God. Come on up. Praise God. Keep coming. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Come all the way up here. Come join me right here. I'm going to ask the prayer team if they'll come up behind these who've come forward. This is the best day of your life. What might seem like the worst day has now just become the best day. You're going from relying on self to saying, God, I give, I let go, and I accept you as in my heart as my Lord and Savior. And so I'm going to ask us, anyone else this morning, if you want to take that step, I'll give one more moment. But anyone else would say yes to Jesus.
to say, Jesus, I let go of myself, my own understanding, my own comfort right now, and I accept you today. If that's you, just come on down. Praise God. Isn't this a beautiful sight? Isn't this wonderful? Praise God. I'm going to ask us to close our eyes, and we're going to pray this prayer together along with those who've come forward for prayer this morning. You know, the Bible says that when one person accepts Jesus, that all the angels in heaven rejoice. Not only are we in this house rejoicing, but all of heaven is rejoicing right now. And so pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I let go of myself. I let go of my own understanding, my own fears, my own questions. I ask you now, come into my heart. Forgive me. Make me into a new person. The old person is passing away. Everything is becoming new. When I leave this place this morning, I'm not going to be the same person. I am forgiven. I am set free. I am made new. I am now a son or daughter of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. 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 As the prayer team prays with you, have just come forward. Again, we just want, I encourage you, go to 9700 and text the words, Zeal Saved. We want to begin walking with you. You've just joined not just the Zeal family, but you've joined the family of God. Everyone who's confessed Jesus as their Savior, you're now part of that family. And as part of the family, we want to share with you, we can't wait to share with you what Jesus is about to do in your life, what he wants to do in your life. Amen? And so, God, we just give them, give you praise. Lord, I just pray, dear God, that you would seal this in their hearts today. Seal this moment. When they walk out the door, dear God, the enemy will want to bombard them with lies and fear. But, Lord, we pray, dear God, as you have come into their heart, dear God, Holy Spirit, remind them who they are in Christ. Remind them that they are now sons and daughters of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. As you remain standing with us, Maybe you're here this morning and, and something was said that was touched on today, whether it was letting go of comfort or control or yourself or expectations of others or the need to know everything, and you're saying, God, I want to give it up today. I don't want to walk out with my bag of rocks. I don't want to carry this any longer, but I want to lay it down at your feet. And if that's you here this morning as the worship team worships, and the prayer team is going to be down here to pray with anybody who wants to come for prayer. But if you want to come down and find a place around the altar and just a physical act of laying it down, saying, God, I give it to you right now, you're free to come. Make it an act of worship. Make it a time to say, God, I give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord in it. Praise God.